legacy. That's the best any of us can hope to leave behind, to achieve something bigger than any individual, any biography or account, to be written into the history books, to be remembered. Many have achieved sporting greatness, achieving what to us mere mortals looks to be impossible. But there is no sport like motorsport. In motorsport, man and machine must work together perfectly in sync with one another, never missing a beat for fear of failure or worse. No era in motorsport's long and storied history has embodied this relationship better than Group B Rally. An era of huge triumph set to a backdrop of failure and tragedy. The stakes higher, the cars deadlier, the drivers braver and the victory sweeter. Out of all of the madness emerged a select few who through untold uncertainty, doubt and fear were able to rise to the top and bask in hard-fought victory. This is a story of daring drivers, brutal machines and Lancer's quest to build the greatest legacy in rally. First, we need to cover some history. Lancia was no stranger to rally by the introduction of the Group B regulations in the early 1980s. In fact, Lancia was somewhat of a force to be reckoned with on the rally stages of Europe going all the way back to the 1960s. 1963 had seen the release of the new Lancia Fulvia, a front-wheel drive family car powered by a new 1.1-litre V4 engine. The underpinnings may not have screamed race car, but the Lancia racing team, HF Squadra Corsa, which Lancia absorbed in 1965, wasted no time in modifying it to race. They started with the marginally sportier coupe variant. First, the V4 was bored out to 1.2 litres, boosting the power output to a mind-melting 88 horsepower. They also reduced the weight, getting rid of the bumpers and replacing the steel doors, bonnet and boot lid with aluminium panels instead. It was an instant success. The plucky little car won the Italian Rally Championship in 1965, and then again in 1966 too. To keep the streak, Lancia increased the engine displacement again, this time to 1.3 litres, winning the Italian Rally Championship yet again in 1967. The little V4 was struggling though. They'd done all they could to make it faster, but it was time for something new. A larger 1.6-litre V4 was introduced at the end of 1967. The Fulvia 1.6 HF wasn't FIA homologated until 1969, but it didn't stop them winning the Italian Rally Championship as a prototype in 1968 and both the Italian and European Rally Championships in 1969. Another important moment in the company's history took place in 1969, their acquisition by Fiat who would come to shape Lancia's future both on and off the road, but I'm getting ahead of myself. After a short break from winning in 1970, the Fulvia was back on form, winning the Italian Rally Championship in 1971, 72 and 73. National success is one thing, but who doesn't want to be the best in the world? 1972 saw the Fulvia achieve the highest accolade in rally, winning the International Championship for Manufacturers, the precursor to the World Rally Championship, cementing its place in history as one of the greats. The following year was tougher for the Fulvia in the newly formed WRC. Lancia were unable to score any podium finishes. Despite a poor performance in the WRC though, they still managed a second European title, an impressive feat for an aging car. By 1974, it was clear that the Fulvia was falling behind the competition, and Lancia were ready to replace it. Well, nearly ready. The Stratos was coming, but not soon enough to make the start of the season, and so out went the Fulvia yet again to compete in the first few rounds, where it managed to score points, helping secure a second WRC title for Lancia as the Stratos stormed the scene and dominated the rest of the season. The Lancia Stratos requires no introduction. Designed by Marcello Gandini at Bertoni and powered by a mid-mounted Ferrari Dino V6, it was the stuff of dreams. And it went like stink. 
racking up three WRC titles, winning in 1974, 75 and 76 in the hands of Sandro Minari and Bjorn Valdegard, having also won the famous Monte Carlo Rally three times, plus another in the hands of a privateer team in 1979, it's safe to say the Stratos is a legend of the sport. Unfortunately, politics prevented the Stratos from competing further, with Lancia's parent company Fiat choosing to place its rally bet on the Fiat 131 at Bath instead, which in fairness went on to become a multi-world champion in its own right. But where did this leave Lancia? Well, for a time, it wasn't too clear. 1979 saw Lancia explore sports car racing with the Beta Monte Carlo Group 5 car, but the brand's heritage was so clearly in rally, when were Fiat going to let them off the leash? The answer came in the form of changes to the WRC. The FIA announced that from 1982, the top eligible class would be Group B, Lancia, Pininfarina, Dallara and new Fiat acquisition at Bath, set about designing and building the ultimate Group B rally monster. Group B was no joke, the competition promised to be the toughest, the fastest and therefore hopefully the most watched in rally history, and manufacturers weren't playing games. A bath actually completed most of the initial design work, and in fact the car was originally designated as an Abarth SE037. However, Fiat decided that the Lancia brand would better carry the mantle, and so the project became the Lancia Rally, though it is still mostly referred to as its codename, 037. What Lancia created was like nothing from the brand's history. The 037 boasted a Kevlar chassis with steel tube front and rear subframes, and fiberglass body panels to save weight. The success of the Fulvia through the 60s and 70s had proven to Lancia that lightness was not just important, but perhaps even more important than raw power. The whole car weighed just 960 kilograms, the class limit. Powering the new car was a supercharged inline four-cylinder engine, mounted in the middle of the car, behind the cockpit for better weight distribution, similar to the Stratos. The engine can trace its roots back to the Fiat 131, but of course with some modifications to help it produce 280 horsepower. Most of the cars competing in Group B's inaugural season had been carried over from the days of Group 4. Like these reworked Group 4 cars, Lancia chose a proven and reliable rear-wheel drive layout, leaving Audi to experiment with four-wheel drive almost by themselves. The Audi did have more power though, boasting 300 horsepower, a leg up on Lancia's 280 and Opel's 260. Courtesy of Group B's homologation requirements, which served less to keep the race cars in check and more to provide incentive for companies to produce some of the most insane road cars ever made, 200 road-going 037s were made. These were built almost the same way as the competition cars, with only a few token attempts made to make the car anything resembling a normal road car. The interior remained spartan, the engine remained savage, and the drivers would certainly still need some bravery. The first season, contested under the new rules, saw frustratingly little success for Lancia and their new car. They struggled with reliability issues, retiring from the first event with gearbox failure affecting both cars. Shocking that a Lancia might break down, I know. Despite problems, the 037 did manage a few victories in 1982, though not enough to be in contention for either the Constructors' Championship, won by Audi, or the Drivers' Championship, won by Volta Roll in an Opel Esconda 400. For 1983, Roll joined the Lancia team to drive the 037, along with Marco Allen. 83 would turn out to be a complete turnaround for Lancia, as they went from middling to dominating. The 037 went on to win the 1983 World Rally Championship, putting Lancia back on top after seven years. They were back. But despite winning, the choice to build a rear-wheel drive car was beginning to look like a misstep, and the lackluster performance in 1984, even with the benefit of the more powerful Evo 2 variant, proved that Lancia needed a four-wheel drive machine to compete. They were going to design an entirely new car, an unbeatable rally beast the likes of Peugeot and Audi could only dream of beating. 
They were going to build a titan of tarmac, a god of gravel, a monument to speed in the image of the Lancia Delta. Having the new car be based around the Delta was, I believe, probably, the company's corporate brain trying to justify to itself the enormous expense of the undertaking they were taking on. The thinking was that having a successful rally program with a car that had a similar shape and shared a name with the company's family hatchback offering would increase sales. After all, what wins on Sunday sells on Monday, right? Or at least that's what they told the accounting department. The road-going Lancia Delta was not all that much to write home about, really. It started life in 1979 as the smaller sibling to Lancia's Big Beta. Most of the reason we think the Delta is cool today is undoubtedly a result of the rally effort. So I guess in that way, the marketing team were really onto something. This video isn't about the road car, and nor does it need to be. As you'll see, the burgeoning Group B project car was only tangentially related to the road car anyway. But there is one thing that you need to remember about the road car, and that's that in 1986, Lancia unveiled the Delta HF four-wheel drive in Turin. It had 163 brake horsepower from a two-liter engine, and crucially, was four-wheel drive. But back to 1984 now. The successor to the 037 finally had a name. It was called the Delta S4, meaning supercharged and four-wheel drive. They took what they'd learned from the briefly successful 037 and built the car around a steel tubular space frame chassis, used Kevlar composite body panels, and mounted the engine in the middle behind the crew. Beyond that, a lot was changed. The engine was supercharged, as I said, but it was also turbocharged. This twin charging was supposed to increase peak power output, but also broaden the power band across the entire rev range. A rev range that was truly enormous. The engineers at Abarth, Lancia and Abarth were both owned by Fiat at this point, had created a 1,759cc four-cylinder engine capable of revving up to 10,000 RPM. The stated peak power output figure was 450 brake horsepower, though it's believed that the actual figure was maybe up to 100 brake horsepower more than this. The engine displacement, once multiplied by 1.4 per the FISA regulations regarding forced induction, placed the new Delta S4 into the 2 to 2.5 litre class which had a minimum weight of 890 kilograms. Now, Lancia had added quite a lot of weight with their new four-wheel drive system, and were now looking for any way possible to save as much as possible. They did this everywhere, thinning the tubes of the space frame chassis, creating thinner and thinner Kevlar composite body panels to clad what was effectively just a silhouette at this point. And eventually, they ditched things like skid plates altogether. They just got rid of them, and they replaced all the windows with polycarbonate. This extreme weight saving proved overzealous in testing. When the car basically just fell apart, it was too weak to hold itself together. This resulted in important strengthening work needing doing to multiple points on the chassis. This resulted in a 950 kilogram weight for tarmac events and a 1050 kilogram weight for dirt events. To claim this thinly veiled silhouette racer was at all related to the Delta road car was hilarious. But as per the Group B regulations, the car did need to be related to a road car. So, they did what everyone else had been doing, and what Lancia themselves had done with the 037, and made a homologation special. The Delta S4 Stradale, meaning street, was pretty much what you'd expect from a box-ticking exercise meant only to homologate one of the wildest rally cars ever made. It was the same car, with some sound deadening and some Alcantara to make it feel like you weren't in a steel-reinforced Tupperware box, and actual glass for windows which was actually not a quality of life thing and uh, was just to save money. Though in an act of true thoughtfulness, they did at least give you air conditioning, though the jury is still out on whether or not that actually counteracted the heat from the engine, 
let alone the weather. The Group B rule set stated that at least 200 of these road homologated cars had to be built, but what's racing without loopholes? And the Group B rules had a big one. I won't go into it in too much detail, but basically there was a loophole in the evolution rules that meant Lancia didn't have to build anywhere near that. The estimates vary quite widely on how many they actually built. The low end says 45, the high end says 150. Either way you go, it's less than 200. But most of these were apparently converted into race cars pretty soon after production anyway, so it's not actually known how many surviving actual Stradales are out there. Probably not very many. Before the Delta S4 was homologated for competition, Lancia continued to run the 037. Unsurprisingly, the car wasn't a front runner. At the Tour de Course in 1985, tragedy struck the team and the sport. Lancia driver Attilio Bottega crashed his 037 into a tree. Luckily, his co driver escaped unharmed, but Bottega was killed instantly. Questions were beginning to be asked around the safety of these cars, but nobody stopped to answer them. The Delta S4 was homologated for the final race of the 1985 season. At the RAC rally in Wales, larger driver Henry Toivonen took victory, and Marco Allen, driving a second Delta S4, took second place as well. Peugeot won the Constructors' Championship that year, and Peugeot driver Timo Salonen took the Drivers' Championship, but with Lancia claiming a 1-2 on their new car's debut, all eyes were on the Lancia Delta S4 going into 1986. Toivonen won the opening round in Monte Carlo, cementing himself and the Delta S4 as frontrunners in the championship. Peugeot were hot on their heels, winning round two after Toivonen's S4 suffered an engine failure. Marco Allen in the other Delta S4 took second place. The following event was the Portuguese Rally. For those of you who know about Group B history at all, you'll know what that means. And for those of you who don't, it's bleak. The driver of a competing Ford RS200 lost control of his car entering a bend. Now, you'll have seen from Group B footage both in this video and others, I'm sure, that rally crowds at the time had a propensity for closeness to the track. Undoubtedly, this was a thrilling spectator experience, but everyone involved, especially, and I, I cannot stress this enough, especially event organizers, should have known better. The car barreled into the crowd. Three people were killed, and more than 30 more were injured. This marked one of the sport's darkest ever days. All of the factory drivers on the grid pulled out immediately. Some of the privateer teams continued to compete. One of them was running a Renault 5 Maxi Turbo, and they won. Following the horrendous accident in Portugal, it could be argued that the writing was already on the wall for Group B as a class. But the show went on, and the rally moved to Kenya. The Safari Rally was known to be so tough on the cars that Lancia didn't trust the Delta S4 to stay alive. So they fielded the older 037 Evo instead. Unsurprisingly, the slower, older car didn't win. Marco Allen pulled off a pretty impressive third place finish for Lancia in the old 037, while Toyota's Celica took first and second place. The following round was the famous Tour de Course in France. A thousand kilometers of twisting, winding tarmac over just 24 stages. Lancia were the favorites to win. They clearly had the most technologically advanced car, and their car was clearly the fastest but it wasn't without its problems. As I mentioned before, Lancia chose not to run the S4 at the more punishing events because the car had a tendency to, well, fall apart. The weight saving measures had been so extreme that over the distance of a rally, the car would suffer serious damage and would often need serious structural repairs doing between events. One of the scarier reported faults is that the composite floor behind the accelerator pedal could crack, and sometimes the accelerator pedal would get stuck. 
The morning of the rally, star driver Henry Toivonen reported not feeling very well. He insisted that he was well enough to race, and he climbed into the car with co-driver Sergio Cresto. Toivonen's stage times were blisteringly fast. They were well on track to winning the rally until it happened. Spectators and marshals were waiting at the end of his stage to see the championship hopefuls, but they didn't show up. A few minutes went by and it became clear that something was wrong. They sent out a search party to look for them. This stage of the Tour de Course was characterized by narrow roads and steep drops, with much of it outside of the view of spectators and marshals. The driver, co-driver and car were alone. The search party found the car, smouldering in a ravine. Going around a tight left-hand corner, the car had left the road and rolled over a low stone wall. Some spectators, looking from afar, claim to have heard an explosion and seen a fireball. And there is video that supposedly captures this same fireball. What we know for sure is that the car caught fire and both occupants perished at the scene. What was recovered was barely more than a twisted chassis, with the vast majority of the composite bodywork gone too in the inferno. It's believed that the car, which had been caught by a tree as it was tumbling down into the ravine, had suffered a punctured fuel tank. The Delta S4's fuel tank was, like every other component of the car, made very thin to save as much weight as possible. Not only that, but it was mounted partially below the seats, and if you remember, they ditched the skid plates to save weight too. It was very thin, it was unprotected, was under the driver's seat, it was punctured by a tree branch, spilling fuel onto hot componentry. It's not known exactly what caused the accident that led to the deaths of Henry Toivonen and Sergio Cresto that day, but the reaction was immediate. The sports governing body, FISA, immediately announced a development freeze across all of Group B, and it was quickly decided that from 1987, the Group B class would be no more and the class unceremoniously disbanded. It had been known since 1985 that FISA was potentially looking to replace the Group B class with a more prototype-esque class for 1988. Dubbed Group S, many of the established Group B manufacturers were already hard at work creating the perfect Group S car, which would require only 10 examples for homologation. Lancia's take, called the ECV, was a complete overhaul of the entire idea of a rally car. It boasted a carbon fiber and aluminium honeycomb chassis, totally revised aerodynamics, a twin turbo 1.8 liter four cylinder engine, and would be one of the first rally oriented cars to be designed at least partially in computer aided design software. However, along with the end of group B, FISA announced that Group S would not go ahead. The solution to the tragedies that unfolded under the Group B rule set was definitely not to be found in increased manufacturer freedom and even faster cars. Thus marked the beginning of Rally's next era. Group A. The Group A regulations marked a significant shift away from the days of ever increasing power and homologation specials to justify it. Group A was much stricter on power, weight, and road car DNA. While a Group B car had to be similar to a road car of which at least 200 examples had been built, if that, a Group A car had to be based on a car of which at least 5,000 examples had been built, later reduced to 2,500, and different championships interpreted these rules in different ways, and the exact numbers vary by specific championship. They modified the generic rule set. But to cut a very long story short, all of the manufacturers were caught a little bit off guard by this shift, and they were sent scrambling to look for a car in their lineup that was good enough to go rallying with. Lancia, however, didn't have to look very hard. Remember earlier when I asked you to remember that Delta road car? This is where it becomes important again. That road car was a pretty powerful four-wheel drive hatchback. That's exactly what they needed. By dumb luck, Lancia were already making the perfect car, and this would pay big dividends for them. 
They basically took the Lancia Delta HF four-wheel drive, slapped delivery on it, put some off-road tires on it, and hey presto, the Lancia Delta HF four-wheel drive Group A rally car was born and ready to go. Their biggest competition was, perhaps unsurprisingly, Audi who threw Hanu Mikla and Volta Roll into Audi 200s and set them loose. That campaign went so well that Audi left the sport. That's not entirely fair. They came a respectable, albeit distant, second place in 1987, and they did manage a mighty 1-2 finish at the Safari Rally, but it wasn't good enough for them to have a second go there. Lancia won pretty effortlessly in 1987, with the rest of the field consisting of a Renault 11 Turbo, a pretty lethargic Mazda 323, a Volkswagen Golf and some German saloon cars. Lancia driver Juha Kankkonen won the Drivers' Championship too, before leaving the team for Toyota. Lancia started off strong in 1988, winning the first two events before wheeling out an updated version of the Delta. It now had bigger brakes and bigger wheels to accommodate, and upgraded suspension to compensate, and some more power, because, you know, why not, I guess? The new improved Delta got a new improved badge as well. It was now called the Delta HF Integrale. Marco Allen's car promptly suffered a transmission failure at the following event, probably to do with the increased power. Luckily for Lancia, one of their other cars, driven by Massimo Biazion, held strong and took victory in the event. After the transmission failure, the team replaced the transmission with a new, upgraded six-speed version. The team went on to dominate this season, winning 10 out of 11 events, only losing one rally to Ford in Corsica. Massimo Biazion won the Drivers' Championship too. Lancia had capitalised well on an unforeseen first mover advantage, but with other manufacturers now having had two years to catch up, how long could Lancia really hold on to their advantage? And if they were going to slip behind, who was going to take their place? Toyota's Celica GT4 had proven fast at times in 1988, but was plagued by reliability problems. Despite a strong driver lineup consisting of Juha Kankkonen, Kenneth Eriksson, and rising rally star Carlos Sainz, 1989 started in familiar fashion for them, suffering multiple mechanical failures early in the season. This was great news for Lancia, though, who pulled a massive lead early in the championship, scoring six consecutive wins. Ignoring Sweden and New Zealand, which didn't count towards championship points. Those two, by the way, were won by Mazda, partly thanks to the fact that a lot of the big factory teams didn't contest the ones that didn't count. The last of this run, the Argentinian rally, was won by Mikel Eriksson, who for the next event, moved to Mitsubishi. Mitsubishi had been having a tough time beating their Galant VR4 into race-winning shape. But after months of hard work, and with Ericsson at the wheel, they managed their first win. Given the domination that Lancia had shown for the last two and a half years, this was surely just a blip, right? Well, the next rally in Australia was won by a resurgent Toyota. Perhaps Lancia's grip on the top spot really was beginning to slip. God forbid they'd actually have to fight for it. Lancia won the following round in the hands of Massimo Miki Biazion, having upgraded the engine from 8 valves to 16. With that, the championship was sewn up. Lancia had won their third consecutive manufacturer's championship, and Miki Biazion took the driver's championship too. They didn't even bother turning up to the final round in Wales. But now with Toyota and potentially Mitsubishi 2 hot on their heels, Lancia needed to be proactive. So, were they? In a word, no, they weren't. The HF Integrale 16V that they had introduced to the Italian Rally in 1989 would be the car that they contested the entire 1990 season with. And while it was an exceptionally capable machine, proven by the fact they actually won a fourth Constructors' Championship with the car, the gap to Toyota had shrunk massively. So much so that Toyota driver Carlos Sainz won a surprise drivers' championship that year, snatching it away from the Lancia team whose wins were spread thin over three drivers. 
by 1991, the competition was fierce. After Sainz's surprise Drivers' Championship victory in 1990, speculation was rife that Lancia really had slipped, and now it was Toyota's time to take the crown. Both manufacturers, and others too looking for a shot at championship victory, were now reportedly spending whatever it would take to win, shoveling seemingly endless supplies of cash into finding creative ways of extracting more speed. Allegedly. There was one rule that had clearly gone out the window though, and that was power. These cars were supposed to be running around about 300 horsepower, but it's believed by this point most of the top teams were running closer to 400. Despite speculation, Lancia fought hard in 1991 and did manage to secure a record fifth consecutive manufacturer's championship. And Lancia driver Juha Kankkonen, who had returned to the team, took the driver's championship too though only by a hair, as Carlos Sainz had suffered an engine failure at the final round. While all this was unfolding, however, Lancia was developing something truly special. It would be the Delta's final form. Stiffer, stronger, more aerodynamic, more power. The Integrale Evoluzione would carry Lancia's high hopes into 1992. Toyota hadn't been idle, though developing what can only really be described as a completely new car for 1992 with their infinite budget. A move that had once again prompted speculation as to whether or not Lancia's tenure at the top of the point sheet could really last another year. It did. Lancia won again in 1992, marking a remarkable six consecutive WRC manufacturer's titles. I can only imagine the blood pressure readings at Toyota after that result came in. It wasn't a total loss for Toyota though. Toyota driver Carlos Sainz claimed his second driver's championship in 1992 after Lancia suffered a plethora of issues in the final round. At the end of the 1992 season, Lancia announced the wildly successful Lancia Martini factory rally effort was going to be shut down and the factory would back a private outfit called Jolly Club. It was the end of an era, but Lancia couldn't have gotten the timing better. It was only a matter of time before someone else managed to dethrone Lancia. Why give them the satisfaction? Lancia had nothing to prove, and while Jolly Club never enjoyed the same success as Lancia Martini, it didn't matter. Lancia were already the most decorated manufacturer in the sport by a huge margin an accolade that the mark holds to this day, with 11 WRC titles. Second place, Citroën. A story for the ages in and of itself, and one that you can hear all about here. Leave a like if you enjoyed the video. Thank you for watching, and until next time, goodbye.